Welcome everybody, my name is François Letarte and this is my channel JDRD30, a channel about tabletop role-playing games. Today, another video of my series about advanced fighting fantasy. A role-playing game published by Orion Games, written by Graham Buckley and based on the fighting fantasy game book series created by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone. Okay, today uh, we will cover a little more about the rules of this game, uh, talking about what we find in the game rules section, and uh, while well, talking about the rules in general. Well, if you have already saw my earlier videos, uh, the link will be below to check them out, and uh, or if you are already a fan of fighting fantasy game books, or if you know the role-playing game, of course, well, you already know the basic mechanic of this rule system which is when you do a regular test you take 2d6 and you have to uh, be equal or less than your skill score if you are doing an opposed test well then you roll 2d6 and you add up to your skill score and you compare uh, against your opponent and the highest roll win the thing that makes the role playing different from the game books is that your character may have some special skills that he can add to his uh, basic skill score so he can be better at some stuff. Basically it's that, of course there are more details that are uh, explained in the hero creation video and uh, this chapter. But today, yeah, I will talk a little about the rules and maybe how to interpret them in general, you know, what, what kind of approach, well, the approach that I think, uh, well, the approach that I, that works well for me. So it will be some kind of a flip through of uh, the chapter itself. So it's chapter two in the book. So the chapter begins with explaining once again unopposed tests and opposed tests. Uh, which can be modified by many types of modifiers. Uh, even though in the game book sometimes you were doing some tests and they were making some modifiers to the test. They were, well, they were not detailing why they were making those modifiers. Uh, usually it was a difficult situation, but there were no details on why they chose to, to modify by that number. But in the, in the role-playing games there are some examples. Uh, they are explaining the luck test when you are testing your luck score. Uh, just remember when you are testing your luck, you lose one point of luck every time. Uh, usually the game master is the one calling for luck tests. These are tests about stuff that are out of the control of the character. Okay, It's, it's just mere luck. Uh, sometimes the character can elect to use luck instead of a standard skill test uh, so yeah he, he can use his luck about any time but since the luck score is something that is going down by itself and it doesn't really come back that easily uh, the character has to think before uh, choosing to use his luck score okay there are some rules about movement as in many uh, role-playing games uh, yeah well they are talking about that the character can move two meters in a combat round and stuff like that. There are some details like that, but while playing the game I didn't feel that it was that necessary to be that precise, although it's not very detailed. Um, riding skills, climbing, okay, there's lots of modifiers for climbing and um, rules about falling, uh, which is uh, basically a luck test. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I see why, you know, when you are falling, it's not your how good you are that can save you, it's just mere luck. Okay, for, well, what I have to say about all the modifiers is that you can easily eyeball everything. You can have an idea here, but I don't think you have to stop the game to check them out. Yeah, I think you can all eyeball the stuff quite easily. Um... Uh, yeah, well, uh, oh yeah, falling, that's something uh, That's something interesting here. For every five stamina points a, a hero can lose in, to falling, you have to check out the rules to see how many points he will lose, but for every five stamina points, he will lose one skill point, uh, resulting of, uh, you know, crushed bones or broken bones and uh, 
stuff like that. Some jumping rules, swimming and drowning, you know the usual. Okay, some dodging rules, yeah, uh, and encumbrance. Oh yeah, I like this one, encumbrance, you know. You know in Dungeons and Dragons, for example, encumbrance maybe are so often calculated by the actual weight of the object and it's, well, it's quite heavy to, to manage, but here they manage it, manage it quite simply. A normal character can bring up to 10 objects without having any uh, penalty to his movement or his, you know, his physical tests. Uh, well, when we talk about 10 normal sized items, he could bring 10 swords before having a penalty. That's the way it is. Yeah, so you can, uh, you can eyeball the stuff if he's uh, bringing a very heavy object, you can count it as two, two, you know, two encumbrance in uh, in his ten, you know, is allowed ten encumbrance slots, and if we could call it like that, uh, if he's bringing lots of small objects, you can elect that at some point it counts as one encumbrance slot, and well, he can, well, actually, a hero can bring up 20 objects but he will have penalties after 10. Some uh, sp special talents may uh, help the heroes to bring a little more objects but it's very easy to manage you know while playing I have experimented it and every player can manage you know with just one gaze on their sheet what they can bring or not. So yeah we, we're not worrying about the exact weight of the objects it's just that you can bring 10 it's not just about the weight, it's about the size and how easy is it to pack on yourself. So, 10 objects. Easy to, to, to understand. Some rules about social actions, reactions, okay, of the, you know, the good old reactions like the old Dungeons and Dragons, bribery and conning, disguise. We have trading. Uh, you know, there are, the, the character comes with a social scale. Uh, which is a quite abstract rules about uh, what is his rank in the world and it can come into uh, account when uh, doing some social actions you know if you are a peasant and you're trying to convince a king about something he, he never does well uh, your uh, social you know your your social status will have a, an influence on that Hazards and hindrance, we're talking about doors and locks, light, fire, yeah, fire is very uh, destructive here. Uh, some poisons examples, there are three examples here which can be inspired by if you want to create something new. And yeah, there are some rules for disease, two examples of disease. Disease, basically, if some characters has caught a disease, he will lose stamina points that he can't recover or even or even uh, skill points or you know stuff like that uh, well losing skill points in advanced fighting fantasy is a very sad thing because uh, well just losing one skill point uh, it shows a lot into your your role you know you you're dealing with scores that goes from about five to eight skill points and you, you you're dealing with 2d6 you know if you are just changing your skill score by one you know it, it, it plays a lot into the curve of the rolls. Traps, some traps of course it's a fantasy role-playing game old-school type some perception rules with lots of uh, modifiers once again uh, yeah, well, some example. I, I prefer to to eyeball this. You no, know, I will tell you why a little later in the video. Slate of end. Yeah, well, if you want to do some pickpockets, knowledge skill. When you something you have to know about the knowledge skill is that when you have to roll, if you have a magic score on your sheet, usually it's because you are a wizard or or something like that. Well, if your magic score is higher than your skill score, the magic score is used for any knowledge skill. They take into account that 
if you got that much magic, it's because you your brain followed <laughs> uh, followed it at some point. That's the way it is. Um, so magic score, if it's higher than your skill, well, it represents your knowledge in some way, in some uh, in any matters regarding knowledge. And the chapter finishes with the experience. Well. Usually a good adventure will give 50, 50 experience point to uh, the adventurers. Some may be more, maybe less, depending on the session. And the, there are the calculation to increase stuff on your sheet. You can increase virtually anything. You can gain new special talent. The only thing you can't raise with experience is the luck score. Luck score is some kind of a divine intervention or something very magical that can raise that. Uh, yeah, it, it's something that happens in the, in the story. Basically, these are the stuff you can find in the rule book. Uh, something you have to know about this game is that it's a old school type of game, okay? This game can be played the same way you can play uh, the old Dungeons and Dragons or games like Swords and Wizardry and you know all those old school type of game that are still around so there are rules but I think this game is not meant to be rules heavy uh, in term of the frequency we will use them okay I think you should say yes to many stuff to your player unless there there's no well unless there's a danger there shouldn't be that much rolls into the game and I'm inspired there directly by the game books themselves you don't roll the dice that much in well except in combats where there are lots of rolls but you know every round your character is in danger so he has to roll for every action he's doing but usually the book gives you some choices about stuff you can do and when you do the, when you do your choice, you just flip through the book, and you, the, the, the description still continue. They don't ask a roll for something that might seem difficult, but if there's no danger, they they're not asking the roll. But if there's some danger, and that's the magic of those books, when you read those books, and they're asking for a roll during uh, your read, well, there's some kind of a tension that will add up. Well, that, that will build at this time, you know, because usually when they're asking for a roll, it's because something very dangerous or something important will happen. And when you roll the dice, you know, that you feel the tension and, and if you, you succeed, you, you, you feel relieved. But if you, you fail, you're all, you, you almost fear checking out the paragraph that it will lead you to. Uh, it's because you, you, you sometimes it may lead to directly to your death. Yet it has this old school feel in those books. You know you can die by a die roll, but you can't go, go that extreme with the role playing game. But that's the way I, I'm inspired by that when I'm running the game. You know I ask for roles when it seems important, and uh, and it, it works. You know it adds up the tension with the players. Okay, you 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 really want to do that test your skill and then the players oh oh they feel that something is going to happen because if you ask to for too much rolls it will one roll or the other won't have that tension you know i have some experiences with games like pathfinder when you have to roll for mostly well for more things than that is for sure so yeah dice rolls are just mundane stuff but when you ask for less rolls, it adds up to the tension. And that's the type of game to do that. You know, I've played this game with people who were used to more rules-heavy games. And they felt that the game was missing something. But no, I'm not, you know, I don't agree with that. It's an old-school game. Everything comes up with what you will say, how you will describe your stuff. And then the rules will come into your way if you're doing something special, something dangerous, something that may uh, hurt you or hurt your group or you know when something bad can happen and you don't know the outcome well that's basically usual stuff 
of role-playing games, but that game is about that. So, that game is to be run by, well, with that old-school mindset, okay? I saw lots of people on forums, you know, modifying the game, uh, instead of just having the skill score, they wanted to make, you know, uh, different attributes like strength, intelligence, stuff like that, a little like Dungeons and Dragons, because they wanted to to have, well, to to, to be less abstract and have numbers for uh, many aspects of their heroes, which is a choice, you know, the, the game will look more a little like Dungeons and Dragons, maybe modern, mo more modern versions of it. Um, the game is solid enough to have that kind of modifiers to it. But uh, I, I think that the skill score, the way I explained it in the, the last video, I think it's, it's, it goes with that old school type of game, you know, it's abstract and it's just there to flip the coin when, you, when needed. So that's the way I see it. It's an old school game, see it as it is. So it's a rules-like game by the way for that. So all the modifiers are just IDs. It can be eyeballed easily. Another thing, uh, some people find it a little uh, confusing to have. Sometimes you have to roll low on your skill score. Sometimes you have to roll high when you're doing a post test. Well, with practice it comes easily. But uh, in the appendix of this book, uh, there are some uh, you know, options to have all all roles working the same way so they they are proposing that the standard test will be roles added to your skill score like a post test and you have to reach up for a difficulty number which looks like lots of games so it can be easy to do that personally i like to keep it that way well maybe for nostalgia since i'm used to fighting fantasy game books and i like the way they are but at the same time it's quite convenient because you don't have to refer to another number you know everything you have to know when you're rolling is on your sheet okay you you rolled you know you know when you uh, when you succeeded and when doing a post test well you roll you say the number and uh, you'll know it when the game master will say what the opponent has got as a result yes we have a visitor a cat <laughs> Yes, so, well, I'm rambling a lot about it, but that's the way you should see it, you know, people who come to this game may have a shock on how rules light it is, but, you know, it's not rules light that much, you know, if you make rich description of what you're doing, if you're making an effort of uh, talking a lot about your stuff, what you're doing, yes, the cat is still there, it's still there. Well, that game can become very rich. And it has that old school feel and unique feel. You know, it's a different type of old school game. You know, usually when we talk about the old school games, we will talk a lot about Dungeons and Dragons and all the retro clones. But that game is different and has that feel. I can tell you that. And the rules, as the subject of this chapter, are very rules light. All the examples are just options. You can eyeball everything, and everything will do fine. Yeah. So, I think I have made the... Uh, well, I think I, I talked enough about the rules of the game. The next video will be more about combat. There will be some combat examples. And yes, Jen of the Green Hill, the character I've created in the last video, will try to fight some monsters to show you how it works. I hope she will survive, because she's a cool character. My name is François Latarte for JDRD30, and up to next time, I hope you have as much fun in your life as in your games. Goodbye.